Have you ever noticed how kids, especially little kids, are obsessed with fairness? Man, if brother gets a snack, I got to have the same snack at the same time. It doesn't matter that I just had four snacks. If brother gets a snack, I get a snack. Isn't that, isn't that the way it is for kids? Or if they, the kids will say this sometimes, well, my friend gets to stay up till midnight on a school night. Why do I have to go to bed at 830? That's not fair. That's not fair. All the other kids stay up till midnight every night except me. That's not fair. Or when, when kids are getting in trouble, they might say something like, it's not fair, I didn't mean to break the limited edition Art Bugatti bowling plate. I didn't mean to do it. It's not fair that I should get punished because it was an accident. In, in my house growing up as a kid, it was not about fairness. It was about R-H-I-P. You know what that means? Rank has its privilege. I was the oldest son. I got the privileges. That is how it works in my house. And I kind of liked it. I mean, if there was a choice, front seat or back, I'm taking the front. R-H-I-P, you know, my my little brother, sorry. You should have been born first. That's that's not my fault. (laughs) But in Shelly's worldview, it is about fairness. Fairness, 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 fairness. So, of course, we merged our two worlds, and we were fair all the time uh, with my kids uh, growing up. So we had several fairness rituals in our family. We had two sons, so uh, Stephen, who was leading worship today, and and Jared. Uh, When they were growing up, we had this little system, and it worked because we only had two kids. Whose day is it? That was our thing. Whose day is it? So Stephen was first born, so he got all odd days, odd odd days of the month. Uh, and notice that on those months of 31, uh-huh, two days in a row, what? <laughs> R-H-I-P, dad's still getting in there a little bit. Uh, but whoever, if it was your day, you go first. If there's any order that has to be done, and good or bad, so you have to brush your teeth first, you have to, you know, get in the shower first or whatever, but also you get the first pick, all that kind of stuff. So you, you, it's your day, so you get it first. And so, you know, that, that was helpful. Another thing I did sometimes is if, we, if we're down to the last little bit of cake and we're going to split it between the two boys, I would say one gets to cut it, the other gets to choose the piece. So you can just bet whoever's cutting that cake, man, he's got the ruler out. <laughs> he's got a level just making sure... Both pieces are equal because the other is going to choose, and the other one's going to choose the biggest one. You know it. Absolutely. Uh, as you grow up, you begin to find out life is generally not fair. It's not fair. Fair means equal. Life is not fair. It just isn't. Uh, but sometimes you can take it too far. So I'm going to get back to that in just a moment. Would you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6? Verses 12 to 15, and if you, it's fine if you got it on an app or, uh, you know, on a tablet, phone, whatever, or in your Bible, great. We always read from the NLT, so that's the translation. If you've got an app, you can choose that one. So we, we've been in this series based on the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus teaching. It's, it's him showing us what the kingdom of God is like, inviting you and me to be a part of it, and showing us how to live in the kingdom of God, how to, how to bring the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus, his first message was, repent. The kingdom of God is here. Like, it's here. It's starting now. It's now and not yet. There's, it's beginning. It's expanding. But there's a lot more to come in heaven, uh, we know, in the future. So we, because it's so long, we've broken it up in some mini-series. We're, we're, we're talking right now about prayer matters. Prayer matters and also prayer matters. All right, you getting it? You getting my flow? You getting which way I'm, I'm going there? See what I did there? So we know that God would rather have, if he has to choose, he would rather have a short prayer than a show-off prayer, if he has to choose. Now, that does not mean that long prayers are bad. There are several long, long, long prayers written in the Bible that are, they're, certainly, they're, they're very positive. In fact, Jesus himself, one time, prayed a whole chapter. John 17, that's a long prayer, uh, where it was, it was just right towards the end of his life, and he, he just was pouring out his heart to God. But the thing is, he wasn't showing off in that long prayer. He wasn't just repeating his words, blah, 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 over and over again, hoping to beg God the Father for something. 
So long prayers are okay. The, the issue is more showing off or just empty repetitions. That, that's the thing. So Jesus taught his disciples, this is how you pray. And for two or three Sundays now, we're really focusing on that prayer. Jesus, uh, we, it's often called the Lord's Prayer, but really it's the disciples' prayer. Because the disciple asked Jesus, how do we pray? Teach us how. And Jesus said, pray like this. So it's a prayer he gave to us. And, and he's really showing us in this prayer uh, uh, about what God is passionate about. What kinds of things does God really want us as, as followers of Jesus to pray about? What kinds of things? What, what things does God, what, what's on his mind, on his heart? We, we talked about a few weeks ago, honoring God, putting him first, praying for his kingdom to come, his name to be lifted up, his will to be done. That, God is passionate about that. And the really cool thing is that God is not selfish. His will is that you thrive. His will is that you have an awesome life. His will is that everybody has enough. His will is that there be love between people. That's his will. So, yes, we want his will to be done. We want his kingdom to come. And it just happens to be very good for us. But because we love God, we want what he wants. And so he's taught us to pray. Now, the second half of the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer, uh, you see one word over and over and over again. And it's not necessarily the word that you would necessarily think. But that one little two-letter word, if you could get a hold of this, this would revolutionize your prayer life. It would revolutionize the way you pray and the power and passion of your prayer. That word is us. Us. Like, to me, that was such a revelation because I am such an egocentric person. I have always thought all those lines are for me. Give me my food. Uh, uh, for, uh, forgive my sins as I do this, as I forgive others. And for, uh, g- give, give me freedom from sin. Give me, help me overcome. But that is not what Jesus taught us to pray at all. He taught us to pray us. And you're in that. I'm in that us. But it's us. Give us today the food we need. It is, it is a much bigger, loftier thing that God is calling us to. And that's super exciting. That's super cool that you and I get to be part of do, bringing God's kingdom to earth and bringing his will to be done in the things that we're praying about. So Matthew chapter 6, we're in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, jumping in on verse 12 for today. Jesus said, pray like this. And forgive us our sins. Now, I'll just, just mention that word there. Uh, there are a lot of different words that are uh, in the original languages the Bible is written in, translated love. A lot of different words translated sin. A lot of different words translated um, like, like this, sin. And the two primary uh, ways that people in Jesus' day thought about sin was either a burden... So I've sinned and I'm weighed down. God, I need you to lift this burden from me. Or the other primary way they thought of sins were a debt. Debt. And I don't know if that makes sense to you, but if someone smacks you in the face, you might say, you owe me. Or I'm going to get back at you. I'm going to collect on that debt. You just set up a debt with me and now I owe you. You, gotta, you, you took me down, I take you down. We're going to settle this debt because of you, you've injured me. So God is saying, Jesus is teaching us to pray and forgive us our sins, our debts against God and others. As we have forgiven those who sin against us. So there are a couple different ways to take this. Forgive us simultaneously. So as we, simultaneously, so please forgive uh, me and us of our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. So there's kind of a simultaneous idea. So I, I, I'm praying for forgiveness for me and us in context of me also forgiving others who have set up a debt with me, so those who have injured me or hurt me. But there's also another, uh, another way you could take this, and that is in quality. So in other words, forgive us our sins in the same quality, in the same way, in the same thoroughness, in the same widespreadness as we have forgiven those who sin against us. 
And I love this, this translation, the NLT, that it says, as we have forgiven. So it sounds like a process, an ongoing process that is happening. So forgive us our sins. So when I am convicted, Garen, about something I've done wrong, a sin, or something that I knew I was supposed to do it and I didn't do it, I've sinned. Jesus is reminding me, Garen, you're not alone in that. So when you pray for your own forgiveness, you pray for the, the person on either side of you. You pray for the people in your family. You pray for the people in the family of God so that we together can all be following God, forgiven, clean slate, in good relationship with God and with people. Okay, verse 13, he goes on. And he says, and don't let us, and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. I love how it says that in Spanish, rescatanos del maligno. Rescue us from malignancy, from evil, from the evil one. And Jesus goes on and he says, if you, and by the way, we can't see it in English, but this word you is plural. And all the next yous in this, in this verse, these next two verses, are plural. So you could say, if you all forgive those who sin against you all, your heavenly Father will forgive you all. But if you all refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Oh my goodness. This is intense. This, this is important. Everybody, sit up. Lean in. Because Jesus is saying something very, very important to us. We, the problem is, we all want mercy from God for ourselves. Please forgive me of my sins. Please don't punish me for that thing I did. Please don't hold it against me. Please give me one more chance. Please give me a second chance. That's what we want for ourselves. We all want mercy for ourselves, but you know how we pray about others who have injured us? Get them, God. We want justice for others. Isn't that interesting? We say, give me mercy, give them justice. Make them pay. I was tempted to pray that way this week over a little situation. It's tempting. It is, it is tempting to pray that. We are constantly tempted to sin. Now, when I say that, some of you, you're followers of Jesus, and you're thinking, I never sin. <laughs> well, th that puts you in a little different category than Jesus in, when we talk about temptation. Because Jesus, the sinless one, was tempted. You know how we say, oh, I was tempted. Jesus was tempted. Jesus could say, I was tempted. He was tempted. Matthew 4, read it. He was tempted, but he was without sin. We are constantly tempted to sin. Sometimes we sin. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're victorious in that one area, and other times we're not victorious in that one area. You might, you, you might be tempted to cut corners. You might be tempted to be selfish. That's the opposite of the great commandment. You might be tempted to get even. The Bible says, do not take revenge. You might be tempted to be unfaithful. You might be tempted to give up on relationships, on a certain relationship. You might be tempted to look at what's unholy. You might be tempted to doubt God. Jesus says, do not doubt. So it's a sin. You might be tempted to replace God with other things that you're more passionate about. We are all tempted to sin. Constantly, every day, all around us, we are bombarded with temptations to turn away from God and turn our own way. In this passage, Jesus very forcefully asserts in no uncertain terms, you, we are to forgive others. And if you or we don't forgive others, God will not forgive us. Okay, this is so big. I was said just a few moments ago, we all want mercy. We all want forgiveness for ourselves. But you guys, it is in jeopardy if you are holding unforgiveness in your heart against someone else. If you refuse to forgive someone else. Now, I don't know if you're like me. Uh, 
I continually need to forgive. Uh, over this past week, I knew this was coming up, and I just started thinking about all the people that when I, I think about them, I, there's a little mm, inside, just a little, oh, oh. And that's, it, that can take a lot of different, a lot of different forms, uh, the way that goes. Like, oh, I don't want to see him, or oh, that hurt. Oh, I remember. And so I, in my prayer time, man, this week I have just been, I've been going through that list again. Same list of people. And I didn't realize how very, very long it was. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, and it's not necessarily that they did something wrong. It's that I have something against them. That's the issue. Did you, see the, did you see the thing? So I'm not saying there's a long list of bad people around me. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying there's people that I've allowed something in me, an irritation or something, a disappointment, something. And, and I, man, it, it took me a while. <laughs> and then the next day the Lord said, and there's a couple more that I forgot. So he very pointedly reminded me of them as well. And I tell you what, you guys, I want to be forgiven. And I want us to be forgiven. And so, as I was praying for different ones of you this week, I prayed Jesus' way. And I said, Father, forgive us our sins. As we have forgiven those who sin against us. Some of you right now, you have a big challenge in front of you. Because there's, there's something going down right now. It's, it's hard to forgive. But Jesus says, come into the kingdom. Amen. Come and find release for your burden. Come and find everything that you need. It all starts with God's forgiveness. Would you just, before we even go on, just take a moment to, the, to list in your mind just silently, some of the things that God has forgiven you for. Just think back over your life, recent or long past. What have you ever prayed God forgive me for? And he did. He did forgive you. Just think of that for a moment. What has God forgiven me for? How many can think of more than one thing? Yes. I can too. Jesus told a very poignant story, a parable he called, or we, we call it, to drive home his command and his demand that you and I forgive others. It's, the story is found in Matthew 18, starts in verse 21. And one of Jesus' closest disciples, Peter, came to Jesus, and he must have been going through something. And he said, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive when someone, forg when someone hurts me, when someone offends me, when someone says something bad about me, when someone did not keep their promise to me and I'm mad, when, when someone actually physically hurt me, when someone stole from me, how many times do I have to forgive? And so Peter throws out a number. Is it seven, God's perfect number? Because someone just got to seven, I'm waiting for number eight. You know what I mean? When I can let them have it. And Jesus answers with kind of an exaggeration. No, 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 no. Not seven. Seventy times seven. So it means if, if, if one person hurt you the same way 490 times, and it, even that's not exact because at 491 you don't get to go clobber them. <laughs> Jesus is using an exaggeration, hyperbole. He's saying, you just keep forgiving and so he, he said, okay, <laughs> I need to tell you a story. He said in verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven, okay, listen, the whole Sermon on the Mount is about the kingdom of heaven. Yep. Jesus is inviting you and me to be a part of it and to expand it, extend it. And Jesus said, you want to know what the kingdom of heaven's like? It can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors, okay, now we know a little bit more about that word debt, don't we? One of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. 
He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, and that would be, uh, we don't do that quite that way today, but he, that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. So he had borrowed millions of dollars. I'm guessing he lived in a pretty nice house, had three pretty nice cars, a couple of wives, a bunch of kids. Okay, he had a lot to lose. The master ordered everything he had be sold to pay the debt. Verse 26, but the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. We want mercy, don't we? (laughs) Then his master was filled with pity for him. Wow, what? How could that be? And he released him from the debt and forgave his debt. He did not have to do that. But he felt something. That king in this story had pity on him, and, and he, re- he released him. So when this guy leaves his presence, wouldn't you think he would like go right to church and start praising God, start singing worship songs, Jaira, you are enough. He would just be going, oh, God is so good. The king is so good. Wow, oh, man, my life is so awesome. But instead... He goes and he sees the guy that owes him a few thousand dollars compared to a few million dollars. He sees that guy and he goes and he grabs him by the neck and he goes, pay up. You owe me. You owe me a debt. You pay it up right now. And the guy falls down on the ground and says, be patient with me. I don't have it right now, but I will pay you back best I can. Please have mercy on me. And the guy goes, no. Send him to jail. Sell his wife. Sell his kids. Sell him until every last penny is paid up. The world is watching. Just let that sink in for a minute. The world is watching. What's What? The forgiven guy didn't forgive? And so they went and they told the king, this this guy, you forgave. You're not going to believe what he just did. We cannot believe our eyes. Verse 32, then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. Now this is Jesus, the Son of God, talking. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you. This is very serious. This is very, very serious. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Oh my goodness. Jesus taught us in the parable that our Father wants you to extend to the people who've hurt you or offended you the same grace, the same mercy that you've received from God. And he said, if you don't, he just, he doesn't even leave it. Like, "Mm, if we don't, what happens? He tells us, if you don't forgive others, you show that you are not forgiven. Because a forgiven person would release others from their debts. Here it is in a little phrase. Forgiven people forgive people. That, that's just what you do. If, if you're not forgiving, are you even forgiven yourself? Are you even saved? Wow, that just smacks me, me in the face so hard. That's why I got down on my knees this week. I was like, and I just began to, one more time, release them. I release them from that debt. I release them to you. And that's, that's the kind of way I would pray over many of these situations. I release them to you. Uh, Lord, they are your servant. They're not mine. It's not my worry. If you, uh, whatever you want to do in their life, you do it. And then, to seal the deal, I say, and would you bless them? And I start going down all the ways I want to be blessed. 
Would you bless their finances? Would you bless their marriage? Would you bless their ministry? Would you bless their walk with you most of all? And I'll probably have to do that again and again and again. It's not easy. It's not just a one and done. Not, it's not quick. Because some, some people have hurt you really bad. And it, take, it takes some rooting up that, that unforgiveness out. So forgiveness was the sandwich. In, there's three, uh, three or four verses today. It's the beginning and end. Right in the middle, he talks about temptation. Temptation is tempting. And the tempter is trying to trap you. It's tempting. If, it's, if it weren't tempting, we wouldn't call it temptation. We call it something else. Annoyance, irritation, something. Temptation is tempting. It is. But you don't have to yield to temptation. You have a rescuer. I love what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. I, I remember many, many years ago, I was talking with a friend, and we're kind of burying our souls, and he said, well, you, you don't understand. I, I'm, just more, I, I'm just more prone to this temptation than others. Well, the Bible says everybody's tempted, <laughs> everybody, and God is faithful. Somebody say faithful. faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Here's the trouble. When you're tempted, when you get in uh, what some author, authors call the hot zone, when you're starting to head down that direction, especially of that old familiar sin, it is very hard to pull back. But the truth is, you can the truth is there is a God who's not wishy-washy. <laughs> there is a God who is faithful. There is a God who is strong when you're weak. He is strong. And the truth is he will show you a way out so that you can endure, so that you can overcome. It's interesting that in the parable, the angry king turns that unforgiving servant over to, the, it says in the NLT, to, over, to be tortured. But in the original, the root word there, he's saying, it's, he's, he mentions the torturers. He, Jesus, uh, Jesus in the parable said, the king turned him over to the torturer jailer, the tormentor. That, uh, that uh, jailer, that, uh, that uh, torturer who would be trying to get a confession out or trying to coerce or trying to punish a prisoner. This angry king turned that unforgiving servant over to the tormentors. And that is a picture of what happens when we walk in intentional unforgiveness. When you refuse to forgive, you open a door to the demons. You open a door to the devil. It is an open door to oppression to torment from the enemy. Yeah. Unforgiveness is an open door. On our, our monthly deliverance nights on Wednesday nights, first Wednesday of each month, we've been talking about open doors, things that have happened to us and open a door in our lives or things that we have done. This is one of the doors we open by being unforgiving. We open a door to demonic activity and influence in our lives. Nobody wants that. So it makes sense that Jesus said, pray like this. Pray we forgive others. Pray that we are, uh, as, uh, that um, for our forgiveness and that we forgive others. Pray that we overcome temptation and be delivered from oppression. And then he ends it up after the prayer, he says, forgive or else. There's, those things are connected Freedom in your walk with God is connected to how you forgive others. Wow. But God has a solution, and Jesus is God's solution. His sacrificial death brought justice. You know how we want justice for everyone else? Jesus brought it. He paid for every sin that has been committed, that is being committed, or that will be committed. So that guy that you want to pay, he did. Jesus took the payment. Yeah. 
Jesus paid for that guy, for that gal. Jesus made the payments. But he also provided mercy for every sinner who ever called on him. Jesus faced the tempter face to face, and Jesus was without sin. And maybe one reason is that he was forgiving. That, that strengthened him. So in view of Jesus' finished work, you are taking on God's heart for all of us when you yearn and you pray that our sins would be forgiven, that we would overcome temptation. When, when you, are, you are taking on God's heart, when you yearn for that, not just for yourself, but for the people around you, the people in the family of God, when you yearn for that, you have a heart like God. Forgive us our sins as we forgive and save us from ourselves and from Satan's schemes trying to make us fall. And so we rely on God for our daily needs, for his kingdom to come, to, for forgiveness of sins, for all of that, for overcoming temptation. That's how Jesus taught us how to pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? And let's pray. Would you bow your heads at home or wherever you're watching? Would you just bow your heads to make where you are a place of prayer? And let's pray. Let's talk to God and let's listen to God. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give us your heart when we pray. You have convicted me so many times of how self-centered and self-focused my prayers are, and I don't want to be like that. I, I repent of that. And I pray for all of us, Father, that you would help us to pray for each other the way that you taught us to pray. With your head still bowed, I just want to ask you, do you need to forgive is there someone you need to forgive? Could you just raise your hand? Yeah, man, I, I think most of us have something. It's good. Your honesty is good. So, Lord, I pray, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And, Lord, I pray that you would just take the sting out of what they did, what was done to us, what they said, what they stole, how they hurt. Lord, take the sting out. And Lord, help us to forgive. Help us to release them to you. Help us to no longer be wishing for their punishment. But help us to leave that in your hands. And so right now, we leave it in your hands. And we go a step further and we say, bless them, Lord. Bless most of all their walk with you. Bless their walk with you. Help them to draw closer to you today and this year than ever before in their lives, Lord God. Lord, free us from torment. I just pray, Lord, right now, if any of us is experiencing demonic oppression, torment, because we've been handed over to the tormentors, Lord, free us from that. Amen. Lord, help us to close that door. We close that door by forgiving right now in Jesus' name. Lord, give us power to overcome temptation. Lord, some of us, are, are uh, we don't even recognize it anymore that, that, we're, that we're yielding. Lord, help, help us to see it. Lord God, help us to, to, to say no to temptation. Help us to say yes to you, Lord God. Help us to walk in victory as a people, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Rescue us from the evil one. We're not unaware of his schemes, so rescue us from the schemes and strategies of the evil one. And continuing in this atmosphere of prayer, I just want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. Maybe you've walked away from him. You've realized your, your, your relationship with God just kind of fizzled and you kind of walked away and you're coming back today. Or, or maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus. Maybe you've been hoping you're good enough and there's nothing you or I could do to be good enough. We're all born in sin and we need a Savior. You need a Savior. I need a Savior. So I want to invite you to put your faith in the Savior, in His work, to trust Him. If you want to do that today, if you want to put your faith in Jesus, would you just raise your hand online? Would you just raise your hand to God and God sees you right where you are? And I just want to invite you uh, to pray this prayer. If, you're, if you have not prayed this prayer, if you're coming back to Jesus, would you pray this prayer? And church, let's, let's, let's support those who are praying right now. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sins and make me new. I choose to follow you. Lead me, starting now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, you are forgiven.
Good news is the answer to a prayer for forgiveness from God is always yes. Praise the Lord. So if you did that, would you just let me know? Would you text the word restart because you're restarting your life with Jesus to the phone number 97000 and give me enough contact info I can get back to you. And I just want to encourage you in your faith. Amen. Thanks for being here. God bless you. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Garen. You know, when, when I think about just how much God has forgiven me, has forgiven us for, like, it's a lot, right? But that's also that, that high amount, that's the standard that God holds us to. So we need to just go out, like Pastor Garen said, and just be forgiving, live lives as forgiving as God, as Jesus did for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, it's so good to see you. If you are new, would you just text the word greet to 97,000? Um, that just helps us connect with you. Helps us. It's, it's, a, it's your first step on getting connected to our church. And that's what we're all about. We're about sharing Jesus and growing together. And if you are watching this service from online, would you just subscribe to our channel? Um, it just helps more people see our channel, more people hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. If you want to be baptized, which if you raised your hand today and accepted Jesus for the first time, you're in, this is your next step. You, you, you don't have to wait for yourself to become spiritually mature, right? <laughs> Now's your time. So if you want to go to bapti be baptized next week, go to baptism class. It's in the lobby. We'll be there in a minute. God bless you. It's so good to see you. Have a good day.